Okay. Hello everyone, welcome to today's episode. The title is Commentary on the Archetype of the Mage. And so I wanted to speak about an idea which I feel eventually, especially for the sake of all those human beings drawn to um, fantasy imagery. I wanted to speak about the human being that had an intimate relationship with the earth in the sense that the elemental realm was equivalent to one's body. That means, in some sense, human beings have been fascinated by forces in their control and forces beyond their control. Excuse me. All right, let's continue. What can I say? Human beings, they control their human body. Our body is, in some sense, elemental. Technically, whether we are, in some sense, moving the earth as the earth. When I was young, I remember my brother would always go towards the warrior archetype and I would go towards the mage archetype and there was this fascination, this kind of like, um, uh, sometimes people do things that they feel they are given the most freedom in. You know, I can visualize an object moving behind my eyes, but I cannot look at an object and have it move. And the archetype of the mage would in some sense have that intimate relationship where the world and the self, they were both your bodies. That means right now, your, your human body, <clears throat> that's in your elemental control. You can literally administer and move these atoms, you know? But if you wanted to move like the atoms of a tree's branch, then you see it's, it's, it's different. It's like the instantaneity of the mind applies to the body in the world, but not per se to the world. That means if just because the person wants world peace doesn't mean instantly <clears throat> there is world peace. <clears throat> but it could mean that the world is peaceful behind their eyes, you know.
we have something known in the history of our world as magic. What I consider that to be was awareness to a dimension we were evolving into earlier than the rest. And I feel that everything in this life is occurring with different levels of awareness to different individuals. That means eyes are opening uh, on this world and each eye, each sight, each line of sight, each world view is in some sense getting a different view of the world. <clears throat> Magic, there was this idea to it that they would connect, uh, which was the concept of spelling and spells, right? When you look at magic, you kind of see that. And you would wonder, what was that? And it was a sort of vocal projection of a reality that would take your attention more than anything else. So in this life, if you don't realize you're a creature of attention, most likely your attention can get manipulated literally very easily by concepts. That means literally, uh, imagine we have person A in a park and person B in the park. Person B comes and says, person A, you're a terrible person, you know? <clears throat> and person A, if they react to that, if they engage that statement, if, the, if person A for a second forgets how they are seeing person A and lets what person B said be them, that is technically magic successfully conducted. Okay? Words shift the motivation or the direction of the attention. And oftentimes when people were not aware of the linguistic simulation, they thought they were language, you could come and tell someone literally a story and the person would just be limited to that. When we look at <clears throat> the planet, what is it? Human beings all are going towards stories. The issue is which story and through which method of processing. You see, both at the end before, it's like in order for the theist or the atheist to both be people, they need to identify. They need to identify as characters in the story, but the stories they identify is based on different methods of validity. <clears throat> The more the universe becomes an unknown place, the more the valid there is validity in your inner realm. The more you feel you're alone, the more you th what you see is the only thing that's left to be real. And by just saying that language has a very core linguistic position, I'm not trying to deny this idea that people cannot have an interdimensional symbiosis. A person can live with their own mind or they can live with the mind of their environment uh, whatever way it comes across, you know. <clears throat> For me, there was something very brilliant about... Uh, the warrior only having his physical body as, as a body and the mage having the world as a body. Back in the day, they perceived reality in regards to an elemental constitution in the sense that there was earth, air, fire, water, and ether. Okay? And usually these are elements, like if I say earth, you're imagining maybe dirt. If I say water, you're imagining a river. If I say fire, you might, you might be imagining a chimney. <laughs> if I say, for example, uh, air, you might be imagining a canyon, <coughs> wind moving or whatever. So I'm saying these are elements. Now, there is this thing that uh, through Vedic thought, through yogic thought, they felt that this elemental constitution wasn't just for the inner, for the outer realms. So this physical body, they saw it through the, peri the small periodic table of the five elements back in the day, even space was an element. <clears throat> but now, <clears throat> we don't see just the objective realm with that elemental sophistication. It's our inner realms. I feel emotions are like these elements. Anger is like fire. Gentleness is like water, you know? <clears throat> Not being acknowledged or moving invisibly in the world is like wind. 
you know so there came a time where I started to notice all these relationships that the intelligence builds with the objective realm it, it can also perceive subjectively now here's the thing if I ask you what is the meaning of an object if I put an object in front of you or if, if we just show you a picture of a random person and we ask me you don't know who this person is and we ask you is this person a good person or a bad person the options remain open That means the main primal focus of language, uh, magic, was I feel in some sense a relationship with the unknown where you could know the outcome. Like look at this picture I've chosen. In this picture <clears throat> you see a mage. You see someone who in some sense uh, is allowing an elemental engagement. Literally like the light on the guy's hand is a part of his hand. Do you know it's like an energetic relationship, but it may be different intensity. So I hold a coffee cup in my hand, or let's say you hold an energy drink in your hand. So guys, uh, interesting question from Dan in the chat section. <clears throat> By the way, people who are new, feel free to ask questions at any point when I give this talk. You know. <clears throat> Dan says, um, random question I've been meaning to pose to you. If birds evolved to carry seeds around and humans evolved to carry to create computers, are computer chips geology 2.0? The world becomes really interconnected, especially when patterns are strangely sometimes like energy. A pattern is can't be created or destroyed, but it can transform or it can go somewhere else. Sometimes the way I would consider that magic was would be would be it also you see guys not everything began from like a 50% decency and 50% like the morality was different <clears throat> you can say usually when when a human being gets power of some sort they use it um, to increase to get more power you know it's kind of like a person who has more capital they they have more of their business, they have more power to do 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 more in their business, you know, <clears throat> to produce more. So I would kind of say, yeah, you can see it, of course, as human beings are like bees, you know, like birds. We are if we are moving information, information sticks to our uh, shoe like gum, and then it, it gets stuck somewhere else. We can totally see ourselves. I mean, literally. <clears throat> in, two, in 2020, we can totally see, for example, with this coronavirus situation, how there has been a transmission of, for example, <clears throat> uh, an illness, right? So we've been kind of carrying illnesses around. We don't just carry... Um, the human being is, car uh, is literally you're carrying your world, your reality, like uh, a torch in your hand. So Dan, I would say yes, we can maybe see it as a sort of uh, humanized dissemination of information the same way pollen <coughs> uh, connects to the bees, uh, you know, insect limbs, you know, insect legs, like 
or whatever, and the bee goes to other places, and in some sense, what is it that they pollinate other flowers and whatever? So, so what happens is information as we live in this world connects to us and is passed uh, down. Interestingly, it's kind of like information has a scent, has a smell. You know, <clears throat> I feel this might sound strange. You know, it might be a hilarious idea, but I think knowledge. Uh, has an atmosphere, has a vibe, has an aroma. Human beings, you can, uh, they, they see that they can look at the same information, but they won't get the same vibe from it, you know. <clears throat> For me, I was like, <clears throat> you know, an educational system needs to be developed that focuses on exploration more than clarification through repetition. So an I incredible way of wording it, Dan guys in the chat section says, essentially, might the earth be updating itself through us? Yeah, man, I mean, it, like, I'll tell you this, Dan, Swami Krishna, this guy says uh, religion is God remembering himself. So technically, that would be human beings are earth being alive, you know? <clears throat> we could totally see ourselves in a, as an activity, an intelligent activity beyond the human framework. But for me, there, uh, let me tell you, I am constantly drawn into solving this Rubik's Cube of a problem of how do we get an advanced civilization going. That's kind of like my aim. So I thought about the mage and I thought about, for example, a businessman like a billionaire technically is like a mage. They literally can move their hand and... <clears throat> the financial the financial strength and abundance can happen. <clears throat> Do you know what I mean? So it's like in history we see so many examples of power and it all these examples of power in any history you can say it was only when a person felt stronger that they exerted their power. When you feel weaker you don't exert your power. Have you noticed that? When you when you're against an opponent that is stronger than you, you try to get away. But if you're against an opponent where you're stronger, you don't need to get away. They need to get away. <clears throat> but at the same time, you know, Sun Tzu in the Art of War says, the great general, the great warrior defeats his opponent without moving his sword. That means if you can find a non-physical way of solving a problem, you are way you are the better warrior you know because human life is fragile guys it's fragile i don't know even how all these human beings you know how human beings fight constantly you know sometimes i look at these ufc fighters and i'm like bless these guys they're keeping excitement alive but at the same time uh the person is getting so many concussions where i'm like uh you know why destroy yourself in the process of uh, kind of creating new experiences, you know? <clears throat> and of course, I don't know, there's so many activities on this planet that eventually the system is designed to end. So it's all about, it's kind of began, we're in the middle of it, what do we do? So, so Dan, just to, you know, um, clo to close the box of your question, um, I feel, yeah, I feel hu human beings like Terence McKenna even spoke about us being intermediaries for, uh, the techno, for a technological humanity. It's kind of like our, we are not per se, like you can see, uh, biology is a very important thing, or you can see, a. a uh, biology is a phase of creaturehood and uh, phases beyond or after the biological extinction. Because biological extinction doesn't mean the extinction of the mind. That means just because you stop existing as a biological entity, as a biological being, doesn't mean <coughs> you've stopped existing. It just means uh, the bio human biology has gone extinct. I feel that we see ourselves as a personality. 
And we think personalities are the most sophisticated thing because we don't fall in love with objects. <clears throat> we don't fall in love with ideas. I mean, we may be drawn to them, but love is something you can, it's like a value that's there. You know, it's like, it's like an all-you-can-eat buffet that's there. I, I mean, maybe that's not the best <laughs> analogy, but I'm saying like, <clears throat> there's a freedom there. You know, I don't know who can who can love without feeling free in that love. You know, I mean, maybe maybe a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of parents in the world maybe feel that, but 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 I'm saying I don't know. I I feel that um, life is a relationship. We project the relationship. We have a relationship with the objective realm, with the elemental realm. Literally, you don't just have a relationship with your body, you're also having a simultaneous relationship with every single cell that is making your body, <clears throat> that's constituting your biology. So I'm kind of looking at how the mage was wondering about how the world could become its body, and I find the mystical practices got the mage closest to that, not magic. <clears throat> there is magic, of course, but, um, you know, for how many times do you want to bring out a bunny out of a hat, you know? <laughs> what I mean by that is there's, in certain cultures, especially third world countries, there is more hate. And let me tell you what I mean by that. That means any environment that is inefficient, the people will be agitated. When the people of the environment are agitated, they will not have decent gazes upon each other, decent views upon each other. So you can, it's very easy that a group of angry people can, uh, their survival is less, I find, <clears throat> than a group of people who can actually see each other's minds, can see each other's ideas. You know, sometimes in life we get this impression that we got to constantly do something 24-7 be doing something that we never look at the system to wonder about a different value of it, a different revaluation <clears throat> of what has simulated in our experience and whatever the fact influences are, you know? I feel that we are waiting for the next human being, the next human update. And I feel the next human update isn't objective. That means if we want to evolve physically, I feel the next great evolution will be the cyberspace evolution, literally how we will connect ourselves to computers and technology. You know, Right now, we have an intimate relationship with technology. Literally, I have headphones on my ears. That is like technology literally touching, touching my, my physical body, right? But in the future, you might have headphones be added in your ear. You don't know. So, so what I'm telling you is like, <clears throat> it's an awareness to the elemental, but the elemental translates as your mind being the whole world. If I ask you right now, is your mind simultaneously being your body? Is your body simultaneously being your mind? And out of curiosity, I want to know how many people in the chat section feel their body and mind are the same. Or the same moment of awareness. I think freedom is more important than discipline because if you don't, if you don't have the freedom <coughs> to uh, wonder about the discipline, if you don't have freedom to look at the discipline and wonder about its correctness, its, its, its virtue and whatnot, So, so Dan, I see your comment. Give me a second. I'm just going to finish what I'm saying, and I'll, you, you, I really like your comment. I'm going to comment on it. 
<coughs> so here's the thing. We are not just things. <laughs> When I was wondering how my mind is aware of the world and the self, I notice it's the same moment. It's the same energetic experience. That means experience, there is one existence, but there is multiple levels of experience of that existence. So the <coughs> sage was in some sense, rather than making the existence follow uh, the experience follow the existence. Like, here's the thing. I technically feel those people who back in the day in Native, uh, Native American and Amazonian cultures, just in tribal cultures, I mean, literally, these guys would, I don't know, they would get, like, some machete, <clears throat> chop, like, this tree and get some sort of uh, uh, ayahuasca drink from the roots of a plant or something. They would make this unique brew and they would drink it and they would have, they would go on this sort of inner realm spiritual quest or something, you know? <clears throat> so back in the day, people, their magic was on themselves. Literally, you can say someone drinking um, alcohol or anything is they're conducting, they are like a mage, but they are moving their inner realms to some degree. <clears throat> I think movement is always there. I think it's kind of like this idea that, it, like in my childhood when I was 14, guys, I was obsessed with telekin, tele, um, I can't even pronounce it, tele, telekinesis, you know, telekinesis. And telekinesis is the ability to move stuff because when I was younger, I wanted to clean my room without moving. <laughs> You know, that means that sometimes, you know, laziness can inspire you to wonder about the telepathic nature of intelligence, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> and so, I remember coming to, um, at that age of surfing the web and finding this thing where some guy was saying, like, imagine you want to move a candle flame. And so one way of moving the candle flame is literally looking at the candle flame until it's just like your physical body and just like how you instantly move your hand and that hand moves, the candle flame can move to a certain direction. Then I realized, guys, candle flames are the worst thing to practice telekinesis on because you don't know what slight breeze from the air conditioner could be in the room. <laughs> But the whole point of it was that you, you saw yourself not separate from the world, then you moved as a greater energetic uh, phenomena in the world. Right now, it's kind of unique for me. Like, I, I don't feel like I can lift my hand up and have, like, for example, all the rocks in, in my yard suddenly lift into the air. I can't <coughs> lift up all the <coughs> rocks, you know? But... I can move my inner realms with the same freedom. I can't raise my hands in the air and kind of see like lightning coming from the tip of my finger, but in my inner realms, I can imagine what that would look like. That means technically, in, the, in our subtler planes of abstraction, we're all not just mages. We are technically experiencing something close to godhood. The only reason that we separate the inner realms, the imagination from God, even though sometimes for poetic reasons I say your attention is the God of thought, but <clears throat> attention is the God of thought, but I'm, uh, what I mean by that is that there's something else moving it before your belief system. That means it's like before language I saw it was just nature moving. So really, technically, before we even named ourselves, there was no self we literally weren't selves. We were the world. <clears throat> we separated. You know, there was a time I was thinking, what if in four billion years, uh, we have 
so we as our species has kind of like <clears throat> imagine in four billion years we have become so illuminated that we no longer are physical beings and all the other animals are like where we were right now <clears throat> that means imagine 2020 plus 4 billion years all the animals that we look at right now underdeveloped imagine they all have come through the humanoid archetype you know they, have, they, they come through the humanoid phase of living and there is way more than the humanoid phase of living I would say that some people may feel it's just the earth here but I will tell you it's um, the earth is it is true in to our perception the earth is here but to the earth the earth is not just only here that means uh, the mo different moments have different minds and the yogi had to discriminate between the movement of the moment and the movement of the self as a part of the moment <clears throat> that is that discrimination is very crucial in mystical insight because really you're being pulled towards an inseparability you're literally it's like mysticism is like your ego is a snowman and the more you wonder about your true nature the more uh, warmer you're getting and the more warmer to truth getting it's kind of like melting you know the ideological system melts breaks down evaporates then the experience activates you know Sometimes if you have an idea while you're having an experience, let's say you're doing something and you suddenly feel, oh man, why can't I ever get this right? That mindset is technically making your moment become a blind spot, you know? Let me tell you, um, there's nothing wrong with woo woo if your last name was woo. <laughs> But, I, but I'm saying that, it, it's like, listen, everything, even the self is woo-woo. Did you know that? When scientists say that free will is an illusion, technically you're woo-woo that thinks it's real. You know, so everything is woo-woo if free will is an illusion. But the issue is that I feel we are not, we are, we are at a point in history where it, we don't need answers. In the 6th century, I could totally see how people could have had were dying because they had questions, they didn't have information. Now our species has a lot of information, it doesn't have new questions, right? So I feel all the human beings alive in 2020, answers don't really help them. I don't think people need answers. I don't think people need solutions. I think people need to find, uh, they need to ask themselves what's important for themselves. They need to, it's the question that in this moment in history is more important than the answer. Because we have endless answers. The mind is designed literally to see endless shapes, endless variations of shapes. In my mind, I'm an airbender behind my eyes, but in front of my eyes, you know, I bend the air only through my lungs. <laughs> So, so Dan, exactly. Guys, Dan in the chat section said the mystery is alive. No, that's it. It's a living unknown presence that Mr. Within finds moves beyond the language threshold. We literally can't explain anything beyond duality. You can't explain the, the stuff that's empty. You can't explain stuff that's moving at an infinite speed. Do you see? <clears throat> you cannot, we cannot explain the infinite and we cannot explain the empty because we are a formed creature in a condition, conditional free will. We have a conditional free will, you know. That means you need to have a human body. Really, the discussion of free will is like it would get deep if we were asking, did we have free will before we were a physical, before there was a physical uh, emergence of a body? That would be a much more deeper question. But for me, I'm like, all right, 
It's not in, it's not the answer, the truth is not in knowledge. That means knowing is literally the inner realms and coming into a sort of agreement with what the outer realms can be. But it's still an inner realm activity. So I feel literally we cannot see the actual nature of the world as long as we see ourselves first and not the world. So that's the thing. The mage knew that it was the world moving, it was the forces of nature moving, and man's mind was just to give it a direction. Your mind is literally your steering wheel of your moment. <laughs> so if I was to kind of, how would I say, I would say the mage was working with magic, okay, and magic has many views, there's many views on it, you know. What I am saying that what it really is, was it was uh, projecting simulations. And the person not realizing the simulation, they are in a simulation. And that was the whole spell of this. It was literally, <clears throat> it was, it's disturbance. You know what it is? It's, 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 it's the unhonorable magic is... Just uh, spiritual. It's metaphysics without honor. It's 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 literally similar awareness, but it's it's not honorable activity. Because let me tell you, those people who seek power, you might reach it, but you will get crushed. Not because, not because in some sense it's the, it's just the it's literally, it's kind of like the karma, the karma of power is that if you use it, you will also experience a moment where power will be used on you. Literally, your subconscious mind will try to live that other life. And that's why it, attra it attracts to people. So it's kind of like this. Leonardo da Vinci said, simplicity is the most ultimate sophistication. I want everyone who's listening to think as if your subconscious mind is, is living the opposite life of your conscious mind. That means if you think you're a good person right now, your, your mind is, think, is living a bad, is thinking it's bad. If you think you're a bad person right now in your subconscious, you're going to have your conscience, your morality, you know? <clears throat> so I'm telling you, if the mind is living two lives, even though in consciousness we get access to one side. So this is why I was like, what is this? Every day I'm waking up, I'm thinking I'm a good and bad person, thinking the world is a good and bad place. What is this? It never, it's like one day good things happen, I think it's a good place. One day bad things happen, it's a, I think it's a bad place. But really what it is, is it's a changing place. Literally, there's no such thing as a fixed location in a, in a universe with an entropic nature. That means even though we say Earth, but it is not the same Earth. It's all, there's, everything is moving. There's no such thing as stillness, therefore language is the illusion. Language is literally a simulation, guys. It's not us. It never was us. We were watching words. We were watching images. The watcher is not an image, it is, it is the mover through the image. Or the image can move through it. Because let me tell you, I have experienced in this life states of incredible desire, unworldly desire, and also states of incredible worldly contentment. Literally, I've existed days without wanting anything from anything. I've just, I've just been, I've just like being is always like if, if life, if, there, if the purpose of life was to be, everybody has literally uh, successfully uh, completed their life purpose to be. That means existentially, yeah. You know, the purpose of life is like, what, what is the purpose of being? To just be. But it's the purpose of action that com comes with itself with like uh, rare opportunities of value systems.
there is this thing that can happen when the idea of a soul of an eternal being is given to a person too early they can have this sense of artificial uh, I don't want to say artificial freedom but eventless freedom that means some people may feel uh, their metaphysical their relationships with how they feel they're maybe a metaphysical entity is that they feel their self is not just their self there's two ways there's two sorts of enlightenment that can happen and one is the enlightenment of the self and one is the enlightenment of the world now both lead to each other's enlightenment but depends where you start the Bodhisattva went towards the world. The Bodhisattva realized the individual is a phenomena of the world, so why not just serve the world from the beginning? That means it's like you have two options. You can help the people in the world, or you can help the world where people are in it, right? So I realized it's much more efficient if we design a better system than constantly helping people in a bad system, you know? <clears throat> That's the reality of it. You know, it's like some things are, yeah, so many things are not evolved and not updated. The educational system hasn't changed its style since the 1900s. That means the educational system is writing literally like, and like it's, it's, it's literally an artifact. <laughs> so, so anyways, guys, <coughs> I feel... If we realize we're not thoughts, if you realize technically you are not the force, but the force is there, when you, I'm, I'm telling you, I feel uh, most human beings are not living life. And living life doesn't mean just running around till you die. Living, living life means that the value system, the alphabet of meaning behind your eyes updates. Now, experientially, it's better. With when, when, you, when you know things through experience, you know them. When you know things through, let's say, subjective experiences, language and whatnot, it becomes an indirect knowing. It becomes a belief. So it's kind of like this. You only have to believe in what you can't directly access. Anything you directly access, it's no longer belief, it's knowing. So it's the directness of experience that is the real us. So I'm, I'm saying that human beings, we are not characters in a story, we're not just images, we, we use these, we use language and society as means of function. <clears throat> I feel we are an unknown process and to believe life is literally getting a cup and letting, putting it underneath a waterfall and thinking you caught the whole waterfall in the cup. Elon Musk implemented a strategy in business that I think it needs to be uh, also a strategy that is applied to life in general, you know? And Elon Musk was saying, instead of him wanting to start a business and thinking it's going to succeed, it's going to succeed, you know, just him chasing the success, like instead of him uh, having an approach to his business like, like a person going to the gym, you know, I gotta get there, gotta get there, gotta get there. His attitude was, I want to do something. Now, there is a probability of it happening or not. Now, my task is not to per se first go looking for success or that image, but to reduce the percentage of failure. <clears throat> so what that means is when you want to expand your knowledge, yeah, you can try to go get enlightened, sure. Run up the ladder. Or you can, in some sense, wonder about what is preventing you 
from getting on the ladder. In some sense, kind of wondering, Rumi says it the same. Your task is not to seek love, but to get rid of all the barriers you have made against it. So technically, you can increase the percentage of the success or you can reduce the percentage of the failure and that is success also. So the scholarly intent is not to be absolute knowers of reality. You know, it is to reduce... Uh, uh, right now, it's like this. It's literally like 99% unknown, 1% known. That 1% known is our, how we have advanced as creatures using language. That 1% is language. That 99%, just like 99% of the atom is empty, <clears throat> there is 99% of phenomena does like it, it, it's irrelevant to the um, <clears throat> to the way the beginning constitution is. So I'm saying in life you can you know try to constantly get better, or you can reduce. You can either tr try to be efficient from the beginning, or you can reduce the inefficiency, and that's the only that's the long term strategy really. You know, that means short-term strategy, like that's why those people who lie, any person who lies, you can instantly know they, they don't think about the future. Because lying is a good short-term strategy, but it's not a good long-term strategy. Do you see what I mean? Especially for the person, because it, it's like speech is, is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, I find. Anytime a person speaks, that is like rare. You're never going to say words with the same emotion, same feeling, same, same thing there. It's kind of like how I felt sometimes when I've given talks and the talk wasn't recorded or the, the file wouldn't open or <clears throat> the phone battery died in the middle of the talk and the file wasn't saved, like, like various <clears throat> various things. But, but I'm saying... I don't know. We're, we have two options. Either we keep seeing the human being and thinking less value. It's like, ah, oh, the human being, just a bundle of problems. Or we think that the human being is a problem solver. That you, you shouldn't fear any problem in your life. You, you were designed to see them, but you were also designed to move through them. That means a, a problem solver is literally a traveler through problems and solutions. Certain moments, it's like, you don't know, it's, it's hilarious. I'll give you an example, guys. <clears throat> um, kind of last year, my family, um, you know, cousins and aunts, you know, we all met, uh, you know, my grandmother, grandfather, like Persian, Persian families. Um, there's a sort of strange respect for the elders you have which somehow keeps the family relationship long term i don't know i don't know what it is it's just an eastern like it's it's kind of like the persian families are big right so we have big dinners dinner parties uh here and there you know <coughs> where everybody in the family is invited you know nobody's excluded you know so but anyways anyways um so at this dinner, in this dinner party, it, sorry, it wasn't dinner, it was lunch, and we were at my aunt's house, my aunt had set up this thing, and we had ordered pizza from Boston Pizza, right? And so the family was eating pizza, you know, at lunch, and now there were two pizza boxes, and there was one pizza box that had only three slices out of this, and two slices eaten out of the pizza, and there was one pizza box that had only one slice left. And then one of my uncles turns around and says, whoever eats this last pizza, will we can make this box empty. And in some sense, like, I don't know if you guys get the picture of what I'm trying to explain, but pretty much my uncle says, somebody eat this last pizza so we can throw away the box, pizza box. And in that moment, everybody was full just staring at the table. And I just take that pizza from the one box and I just put it on the other box and it's like this hilarious moment where the whole family laughs. You know what I mean? <laughs> <coughs> uh, 
And it was technically a different, it was, it was a solution to the problem which came from a different way of looking at the problem. That means sometimes looking for solutions to problems, you don't have to constantly think of what the answer is. You've got to try to look at the problem in different ways. You know, pretty much every problem in an exam, you're like, okay, what, is, what does this person want? You know, <clears throat> for me, um, th th let me tell you what it is. Teachers shouldn't get comfortable with being treated like statues. A teacher that every student treats the same, I think is a failing teacher, is a teacher that's failed. I honestly feel that's a teacher that's failed. Because that means the teacher has assumed all the students is one type of student. It's like, all right, you're all the same and I'm going to give you one teaching and you better learn it. You know? <laughs> but really, we have different eyes. We can never the same learn the same thing in the same value. We are like different parts of the brain, but the educational system only accepts the frontal lobe. You know? <laughs> Exactly. So Dan, it's in, in, it's, I'm, I'm happy how insightful you are actually. So guys, Dan in the chat section, he says, when the ego dissolves, any power you were seeking through magic without love or wisdom will crush you. CDs are indeed the low lands. Yeah. It's not that CDs are, are, are the low lands. <clears throat> you don't need the CD in the high lands. You don't need power uh, when you move beyond the body your understanding of power becomes something that's no longer condition-based. Right now, most people understand things conditionally. That means it's like we're a creature that has to keep the physical body in a certain balance. <clears throat> and it's like if you eat too much food, you, you can die. If you, eat <laughs> you know, if you eat too much of anything, you can die. You know, something will go off. So the body is kind of meant to be a traveler. It's not meant to be the same thing all the time, 24-7. We're not machines. Uh, you know, human beings that attempt to live artificially intelligent in the future will be controlled by artificial intelligence. Guys, CD is, is it, it means power. Uh, it's, it's a certain special ability. So there was this idea that these yogis would meditate. They will eventually have a certain acute awareness, a certain precision with identifying the nature of the world. When they acknowledge the real nature of the world, they would have powers, right? There were, for example, certain yogis that their CD was they had multiple bodies. That means some part the, the, the yogi, like Sri Ramana Marchi, for example, <coughs> he's never left... I think Sri Ramanamarshi, like certain gurus, they never left the temple, but some guy in Russia saw saw him in the market, and some guy in Japan saw him in a at a hair salon or something. Like it was as if like the mind was was projecting waves of bodies, you know. <clears throat> so the more you live as a mind, the more you get abilities of the mind. But you should also live as a mind. Those people who use magic or power. It's technically, you have the awareness of higher dimensions, but you are behaving like a lower dimensional animal. Because taking is a human game, is a game of a creature. Anytime you appear as a creature, there is a give and take to the karma. But when you appear as not a creature, when you find that inseparability of the individual activity and the cosmic activity, literally there is no one... There is no concept of self to have power to even you wanting to manipulate power. <clears throat> it's like, really, you think energy has a face? <laughs> so that it can be evil and good, you know? <laughs> Existence's real face is beyond uh, the human framework of experience. Right now, I, I will consider every person that's alive. Your humanity is, is, not, is not the full percentage of your being. You are 
the known part, what you know out of your moment is your humanity. You know your humanity because we open our eyes in the human body. <clears throat> but imagine if there was, for example, a simultaneous parallel, civil, parallel version of the earth where there was a civilization and that civilization in your imagination would influence you. Imagine, imagine your mind was multi-local, your body's in one location. This is why, guys, those people who astrally project, who are trying to move in the inner realms, who are trying to, uh, what do you call it? Who are trying to be, who are trying to find heaven, you got to be careful because if you, if you are obsessed with a desire, you're not going to look at it. You're going to want the desire there. You want to want, you're going to want the feeling before knowing what the, what, what the feeling is on, uh, what the feeling relates to, you know. <clears throat> Pretty much you got to study nature. Nature is the best teacher. Nature uh, teaches you, will teach you. If you look at nature, it will, it will, it, nature is the uh, private tutor uh, for the multidimensional one, is a private tutor for the multidimensional one. And I want you to say, show you something. You look at this picture, guys. <clears throat> Even though that's a messed up creature and this guy's hand is doing some cool energetic thing, <clears throat> this guy... The energy, his magic, his magic is his, is an extension of his attention's body. That means if I can move my fingers right now and imagine I moved my fingers and all the trees in my yard started to move like my fingers. You know what I mean? So it would be a situation... Where literally my experience of moving my finger, the same feeling I have when I move my finger, I will have the same feeling with wanting to move the tree. So I am telling you, <clears throat> technically you are a mage, but you are handling the periodic table of elements. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, yeah, man, of course I'm an airbender, but only when I breathe, you know? The person's like, can you control water? The person's like, of course, you know, what do you think I do in the shower? <laughs> <coughs> oh, man. So anyways, guys, I, I think I've kind of shared, about, shared this. I just want to say that... Uh, inseparability of the individual activity and the cosmic activity and not to be a novice of the inner realms and get devoured by image you know <clears throat> images come and go don't worry about them objects they come and go and they change you got to worry about them because your survival is conditional that means if you meet the conditions that uh, allow you to exist then you keep existing if you don't meet those conditions, you don't. You won't exist. So external reality is important. And all, there's two types of mysticism. There's a mysticism that escapes the world, that is trying to wake up from the dream of the world. And there is a mysticism that sees the dream is the where or the only place you can awaken. Where the dream is happening is you can is the only place you can awaken. 
So for me, if this world is an illusion, there's an advantage. If, there, if it is the truth, it is the advantage. Do you see what I mean? I mean, we have to, we are observers of change. We are changeless, attributeless observers of change, and we cherry pick our identification with how we move in the world through the choices that become decisions. <clears throat> so anyways, guys, that's for the talk. Um, that's the end of the talk. I'm going to open it up to Q&A if anybody has a question or wants a second opinion on something, uh, feel free to ask. Uh, something I'm going to do also with the Q&A is that at the end of the q and I'm going to ask a question as if, if I was listening to this talk, what question I would ask. So it's going to... Thanks everyone for tuning in so far. Uh, this is pretty much the Q&A now, so you can tune out if you're not interested in that. Anyways, 10-minute um, Q&A, blessings. So guys, something I noticed um, <clears throat> I didn't really talk about is hearing the earth. I have a relationship with nature that really is nature moving first than me and there's a peacefulness there. There's a bliss there. There is a bliss of knowing that there is other movement other than what I have access to, you know. Technically, we all, our, our lives finish, we're like candles, we're illuminating the environment, the world for a certain period, and then we, in some sense, leave, the candle melts, the light is no longer in the room. So technically, we are living for the potential of, of the light in the room. You know, that means my individual life is actually living for my collective life. And my collective life is the greatest achievement of my individual life. <clears throat> so hearing the earth would be to have that sensitivity of realizing nature is beautiful, even when it's simple. Some of the most beautiful things, like sometimes it's it's not like, you know, I think nowadays people think like men are all like hungry animals or, uh, obsessing over some sort of fetishism. But I'm, but I'm telling you, it's, it's sometimes it's just, it's, it's, it's an emotional relationship where it's like sometimes just a simple thing about someone can be uh, appealing to you, 
you know. <clears throat> there was, you know, and it, it, that means the little things, the simple, the simple dimensions of life are also as important as the complex. And some people who try to increase the speed of their life, they miss out on the, uh, the value of the simple, or how to value it. Yeah. You know? I can't tell you, you will be shocked how much you know if you wonder any complex situation how it arose. Just have the will to wonder and you change the karma of the situation. Or any situation. <clears throat> I'm going to share one story guys and I, I, think, I think nobody has questions so then I'll end off. But I'll say this. Um, there was this, um, I, I don't know which Zen master it was, I think it was maybe Shoryu Suzuki's childhood, or I could be wrong. But there was this um, Zen master who, when he was like a 10-year-old kid, he was at this monastery. And he was like this kind of mischievous Dennis, Dennis the Menace, kind of like, not Dennis the Menace, you know, maybe like, um, <laughs> I, I don't know what an equivalent Zen name would be. To Dennis, but like, <laughs> uh, I'm just saying, literally, this is the story. There's this ten year old kid. He's actually he goes on to be an enlightened figure in our in our in the history of Zen. But in his youth, he breaks this very important vase in the monastery, and he suddenly notices the head of the monastery, the headmaster of the monastery, the head monk is kind of like walking. It, it is like coming, you know. The main, the who's in charge of the monastery, he's coming through the halls, and he's this ten-year-old kid who has broken this important vase. So the kid's smart. What he does is he takes the pieces of the, what do you call it? He takes the pieces of the broken vase, okay, and he hopes he picks them all quickly, and he he puts it behind his hand. He, he literally puts his arms behind him so nobody can see the vase. So his hands are behind him. And he runs to, the vase is behind him too, and he runs to the guy, the, what's his name? <clears throat> he runs to <laughs> the headmaster. So the headmaster is coming, he's like, okay, before the headmaster sees this, I'm going to go talk to him first, right? So he's hiding this vase thing behind him, behind his hands, but in, he looks like, from the front, he looks like this kid whose hands is on his back, and he's standing straight and disciplined and all this. And he goes to the headmaster, and he's like, sir... Please give me a teaching about what death is. And the, and the headmaster's like, this 10-year-old kid is asking me to give him Zen teachings on death. He's like, I'm impressed. You know, this kid's going to go places. <laughs> this kid's, this kid's going to go to the pure lands. Yeah? And, so, and, so, <laughs> and so the guru's so fascinated, excited. He becomes happy. It's such a rare moment, such a unique moment. And he shares, and he shares his insight on death is nothing to fear, it is in some sense part of nature. If you didn't fear the creation, why should you fear the destruction? You know, and so it, it, like he goes through various things and he talks about this emptiness and how our suffering is what we see out of the picture and what, uh, whatnot. And he says a lot of stuff. And he says that it's like, don't fear what, uh, you know, uh, uh, don't fear the clarity of uh, the ever-present mind, something like this. Then this kid's like, thank you, sir. Thank you for this wisdom. But I want to inform you, your vase died. <laughs> and the kid and the kid gives this broken vase to the headmaster. And the headmaster, the headmaster is like, this kid, this kid is really, <laughs> you know. Anyways, that's the story, guys. The kid pretty much uh, asked about his, the kids wonder, as long as you're alive, uh, the outcome can change. The outcome of anything can change. The outcome of your interrupts can instantly change. Literally, it's like the person wanted to drink uh, when the uh, stewardess uh, on the airplane says orange juice or apple juice, you know, or tomato juice. You're like, all right, let's go with apple juice with ice, you know. <laughs> so... It's like you have a choice. So there's always a choice. You can literally, uh, there's been even a time I've I changed my order like the moment I gave it, you know. 
Like literally, I, I there, there was a time where I maybe said orange juice, but then one suddenly said apple juice, you know. So literally, as long as there is a will, there is some ex, some experiential conscious effort. Uh, anything can literally change. And everything is changing, but I'm just saying you, you can consciously change it at the time. You know, that means somebody could be like, uh, it's kind of like this idea that even, that nobody gets out of this world alive physically. And if they do, it's a burden. It's like we're kind of meant to be, this may be an incredibly strange and intense and a little bit of a chaotic idea, but it's kind of like we are like a flower, okay? Or we are like something that the universe is processing us. I feel the same time I'm processing the universe. For example, uh, we eat food and our food sources come from animals, you know? So we are processing the world, literally, physically, you know? And there's going to come a point where I feel like the world is going to... You know, the reason I said it's chaotic, it's because, like, we're devouring the world, and the world devours us. You know, it's, it's this kind of thing. It's kind of this thing where it's literally like a relationship. You're alive with the world. You're, you're, you're in an energetic position you experience and then it's like it's literally like how the caterpillar has access to two two dimensional mobility and has access to a sort of three dimensional mobility too but not the three dimensional mobility that a butterfly has so you, as long as a caterpillar is a caterpillar it can't fly like a butterfly but if the caterpillar goes through some sort of transformation then it becomes a butterfly then it has access, more awareness around, you know, something like that. So it's, it's all like we're thinking the self is projecting awareness, uh, the self is projecting an unknown awareness, or an unknown awareness is projecting a known self, you know. <clears throat> so anyways, guys, thanks for listening. Uh, I hope this episode was uh, helpful. Really, these ideas, archetypes, are just kind of like the alphabet of personalities, really. Anyways, guys, much blessings and I'll see you.